You know, engagement is uh, a word that's not easy to actually partake. We have so much demand for our resources, time, money. And so we need to have something which actually makes us engaged. And one of the things that's happened in terms of future measure education has been technology. And we also see that the people that are participating in the future measure education have problems and opportunities which are common. The solutions are long term. And the other issue that we have is the optimal solution improves all parties. You know, uh, when I walk around uh, St George's Terrace, walks Wall Street, Fleet Street, I ask people in business, what do you want from our students? And they say to me, after they walk away from me, <laughs> they say, well, we want the students to be work ready. We want them to be lifelong learners. We want them to be able to solve practical problems and we want to be able to identify opportunities. And we've asked ourselves at Murdoch, what do we want from our students? And we say, uh, students work ready. We want them to have lifelong learning. We want them to solve practical problems. And we want to identify opportunities. And if we ask the students those questions, exactly what they want. So what we're trying to do here is try to get people in business to engage. We don't want your money. We want something more valuable than that. We want your ideas and your input. And if you want to give us money, we'll take them. Well, <laughs> what do we want from our staff? We want our staff that have invested a lot of time, intellectual capital, to understand the topic, to go deeply into the area, to say, you've done a great job. Technology has changed. We want you to change. Asking people to change is an important issue, but we need to have some mechanism to make them change. I thought what I would do is give you a brief background to the Future of Management report. We've got some copies here, which is an initiative of the Australian Business Deans Council and which the Business Higher Education Roundtable managed, and outline for you some of the major findings and recommendations, and then take you through some of the issues that are pressing but, uh, and were touched upon, but possibly need a little bit more discussion. So the impetus for the Future of Management Education initiative was the result of a series of events uh, coming together that included the changing nature of organizations through technology that was creating a new framework for business operations and called upon a new set of skills for the 21st century workforce. Success in business now depended on this new framework and uh, needed to blend some traditional processes along with some new modes of working. Companies needed to understand this new technological revolution that was going on and what it meant for them and how they need to adapt. And so management education needs to reframe its program to focus heavily on innovation in a global environment. At the same time, the global financial crisis took its toll, and there were many fingers being pointed at business schools um, as the educators of the perpetrators of the crisis. Now, we all know no one believes that business schools caused the crisis. <laughs> Nevertheless, the effect was that a lot of people started talking about um, where was ethics, where was governance, and some soul searching in terms of um, curriculum within management programs. Another effect, of course, of the GFC was that um, businesses had relatively little money to spend on professional development, and so management education had to be seen to be worthwhile for businesses to invest in professional development and upskilling. MBA programs more than ever had to justify their cost. Mm -hmm. So these issues for, you know, made it very timely for the Australian Business Deans Council to start to rethink what they were offering and how they can improve the quality of the programs. And all of these events are relevant, but they should also be, uh, I guess, put in context in which business schools are operating. And firstly, in relation to business schools, the rise in popularity of the past couple of decades of professional business programs at the undergraduate level and the status attributed to MBA programs at the postgraduate level meant that almost every university now markets business programs. And the marketing of all of these business programs means that each university is virtually competing with each other on the one hand 
And on the other hand, all universities are trying to be responsive to business needs. The problem is many, if not most businesses, don't necessarily know what they need for the future or how it differs from what they're doing right now. So the effect of which, uh, uh, the effect is one in which uh, many st stakeholders, education and business concur in that there's a high degree of homogeneity among the management education programs being offered by business schools. Many businesses are not sure how to distinguish one uh, program from another, one university from another. And so we think that there would be some value in a greater differentiation among the business school programs. So this uh, project then was very timely in terms of reviewing uh, a practical review of management education. And it consisted of uh, several components. A scoping paper, um, which is in the, uh, in the report, a consultation with stakeholders, and three innovative practice trials, which I'll briefly touch upon. And of course, the report um, presented offers the outcomes and the recommendations. Now, what's interesting is the speed of change through technology and globalization for both universities and business can be see seen in the sweeping <coughs> developments from the short time period between when this initial proposal was put forward to government and when it was finally implemented. In the 18 to 24 months uh, that took before it was finally improved and um, where we began to work on it, the rise and rise of massive online open courseware, MOOCs, created educational opportunities on a global scale through a new and yet untested and still developing business model for higher education. And these had direct implications obviously, um, for business and graduate um, uh, recruitment. So the university's monopoly on both education and accreditation is now being challenged, and in some cases, being taken up by business educators <coughs> and partners, and moving away from university offerings. Clearly, this has implications, as we all know, for universities and for business schools in particular, and for curriculum content uh, for the skills required, again, for 21st century businesses. So for this reason, uh, the Business Higher Education Roundtable recommended um, that this project include a special forum on MOOCs for business schools, really to provoke thinking uh, for the business deans on how best to position themselves in this new learning environment. And this uh, forum, which was held in February 2013, uh, and again is reported in um, the project report, um, uh, really provided an opportunity to start to think about how business schools can adapt and exploit opportunities prevented, uh, pro provided through online education. The scoping paper uh, was drafted and we had an address uh, in the consultation forums uh, by <coughs> excuse me, Professor Srikant Datar from the Harvard Business School. And the basis of the two forums held in Sydney and in Melbourne uh, were used in the development of the framework for the innovative practice trials. And these forums were extremely useful because they told us that business needed strong leadership and managerial skills. They valued innovation, creativity, and problem-solving skills. They told us that students certainly would benefit from experiential opportunities to work with business uh, and obviously needed softer communication skills and interpersonal skills. Management in Australia, we um, were pretty well told, did not value people enough. Now, this is neither new nor surprising, uh, though certainly accurate and relevant. However, from my own observations and from other roundtables that we hold where we have universities and business uh, as participants, um, we find that very often business executives, when they comment uh, about job readiness and graduates and what they need, they often express these kinds of attributes in terms of what, uh, what their future workforce should look like. 
I'm not sure if this is a pattern of um, what skill mm -hmm. needs business executives think they should have. I'm not absolutely convinced they really know uh, what they need, but they do tend to say the same things. And when you drill down and ask them, but what do you think? What, what do you mean by creativity? What do you mean by innovation? They have a lot of difficulty. So what I'm saying is, I'm not absolutely convinced that business and business executives have a clear understanding, one, what goes on in business schools, and two, what kind of skills they really do need to take them forward over the next couple of decades. They're really thinking about what they have now rather than where they're going. And this information gap, I think, uh, between business and business schools um, was reinforced in the implementation of the innovative practice trials and underpins many of the recommendations. So this lack of communication between uh, management educators and companies really needs to close considerably if in fact we are able to achieve the kind of global, global competitiveness that this country needs. The innovative practice trials um, are detailed in the report and this was a competitive process. We called for submissions. We had an independent judging panel uh, and the successful ones um, were co-funded by the Future of Management Education Project and the individual business schools. And uh, the three projects uh, were one that was done in UTS, the UTS Business School, used in experiential learning as a means of problem solving for students with live case studies. Uh, they followed a program with a partner of theirs, the Fox Business School in the States. And the idea was to demonstrate, demonstrate the business school's capability and relevance to business, as well as to give students an opportunity to work with um, business uh, executives. RMIT had a similar experiential collaboration for an undergraduate program of um, engineers and management students. Swinburne uh, Business School had a different project and they gathered business, industry and educational stakeholders together for a series of workshops trying to design a new curriculum for a sustainable global economy and that's, uh, that's the process that they went through. All three of them obviously worked very closely with business who are, are clearly the direct recipients uh, and major stakeholders of management education. And the report outcomes reinforce the learning value for students um, when they can actually uh, work on live wicked problems with business as part of their educational experience. The projects also reinforce the significance of both quality and relevance for business. From the business perspective, this is an opportunity for executives to become acquainted with modern, sharp students with fresh problem-solving perspectives. So this is something that management uh, education and business schools have to offer business that they wouldn't experience otherwise. Now the recommendations in the report are also neither new nor surprising. Um, and I guess what probably overlays the um, series of recommendations is a sense of urgency. Despite the favorable setting that business innovation, uh, that favorable setting in Australia for business innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, because we have a highly educated population, uh, because we're relatively good in our research output, and we have a relatively good performing economy, Australia's innovation system is not as efficient as it is in other high performing economies. In fact, it's bad, terrible, and getting worse. It's stagnant. Um, and this, in turn, has been correlated with our declining productivity. And what has been recognized is that innovation is the key to productivity growth. On almost every OECD metric, uh, global innovation metric, and even yesterday when I was on the plane reading The Age, the World Economic Forum put out the latest competitiveness, um, results of the competitiveness survey, Australia is not just staying put, it's lo losing ground, it's declining. And 
that says something about what's going on amongst our competitors, where there is a much greater in investment in both innovation and management education. <coughs> so the future of management education recommendations clearly spell out the need for business schools and industry to deepen their collaboration so that innovative experiential models of teaching and learning are offered to students which are at the same time relevant to business needs and contribute to the sharp competitive edge that characterizes a modern knowledge economy. On a, as an aside, I would say I don't think business yet, and maybe Kurt will be able to comment on this, sees our economy as a knowledge economy. I still think we think in more traditional economic terms, and that might be worthy of discussion. So the major recommendations are that management education must contribute through intervention programs which combine analytical and design thinking and infrastructure that connects technology and online resources <coughs> in award programs and executive um, education. That is, bridge the process between business ideas and the successful rollout of innovations. Business uh, schools must produce graduates with interdisciplinary skills that include collaboration, problem solving, and entrepreneurial thinking. A country's skill base is commonly measured by a proxy measure of education innovation ready. And my guess is Australia would not score very highly on that proxy measure. Management education needs to reflect the new assortment of organizational structures that cover large companies, small companies, uh, startups, both domestic and international. That is everything from people working in, as part of a technology hub to something that could be a Google or an Apple, to BHP with employees from all over the world. The real challenge is that there is no longer a standard company. And every company is connected with lots of different other types of companies. And you need to be able to deal with them uh, very effectively. So this is nothing short of a transformation which has at its source productive collaboration between business and business schools as a means to enhance innovation. The absolutely essential component to be able to compete in a global market. Management education, in my view, must be at the forefront of Australia's changing economy so that we're both prepared and excited to meet the challenges of the coming decade. And Australia is in an excellent position to meet these challenges because we have a strong foothold uh, on many of the industries that are in global demand. Industries such as agriculture, education, biomedical and health research, smart manufacturing. And these industries need to be mobilized and managed and we need to be educating leaders that can actually realize that potential. One additional issue that emerged that concerns business schools and universities is relevant here. Business schools internally must minimize the disconnect between the professional programs which focus on practical application for the companies and their role as academics, which focuses on research output and quality teaching. This is a really complicated problem um, and is tied to government funding and is probably not easily resolved, but it must be addressed. Um, this is where we need to be able to um, uh, merge staff, output, and delivery of programs that are both relevant to business, relevant to universities, and allow for the um, blending of teaching, research, and business needs. And the gap between the schools and businesses, their prime stakeholders, needs to be uh, entirely um, <coughs> diminished. Now, in managing the project, um, I had the advantage of being an interested external observer. And certainly from the consultation workshops and the innovative practice trials, I really formed the view that business schools need to reclaim their authority and expertise in guiding business to operate comfortably and successfully in this new globally highly competitive technology-based and multicultural environment. All of this, including global citizenship and ethics and governance 
needs to be incorporated into management education programs. Executive development programs need to appreciate that Australian business is in catch-up mode. And although we can do this, we really need to be thinking about doing it now. Business schools need to be seen to be able to provide the platform for change and they need to do it as professionally and effectively as possible. Business schools need to educate business about their value and worth. The Future of Management Education project showed us that business does not look to business schools for expert guidance and that is part of the problem. Business and industry don't fully appreciate and apply the knowledge and impact of practical research inherent in business schools. Things like the changing role of manufacturing and service industries, international trends, future global trends, um, uh, success and failure, understanding failure, and how it can teach us to do better the next time. What does all this mean? Business schools need to educate business as much as their students about management and skills for the next decade. So this brings me back to the importance of collaboration and the critical role in innovation. Business schools themselves need to be clear about what they can offer business and the community. They need to be able to articulate what it is that they are working on. Business generally champions innovation, relevance and practice to be high on the teaching agenda and their commitment and active involvement is critical for the future success of our future leaders. Business schools must be responsive and become the indispensable educational partners for business in the water community. They must also be instructive uh, for business in demonstrating <coughs> convincingly how management education will address the complex, high-tech, increasingly globalized business environment that is in play and operates in an interdisciplinary and interprofessional setting. So that's a lot to deal with. The hurdles associated with developing a management education framework that is both responsive to business, satisfies higher education accountabilities, and is current and innovative is confronting. I'm mindful that the responsibility of business schools to educate our future leaders is more important than ever for a small country like ours that will depend on being smart more than anything else. I'm also mindful that to produce world-class leaders requires partnerships between the business school educators and the business uh, practitioners. And that, to me, is the real challenge. Thank you. You know, you, you always know you're sort of in trouble when you come to one of these panels and, and um, it's either the cars that are parked, beautiful labels, or you sit at a table like this and you sort of realise you're the guy without the... Uh, the title there, so you started at, at a position of relative inferiority. <laughs> Luckily, I'm, I'm married to a, a PhD in nanochemistry, so that, that happens home me every day. Um, look, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, I've really been fortunate that by as well, I've been doing 20 years, so really getting old now, um, of, of working uh, across probably almost every industry, major industry, and um, in the Deloitte ecosystem, which is the world's largest consulting firm, across almost every kind of key competency we've got. And I, I'm a chartered accountant, so I'm a business school graduate, and business school gave me the most amazing ability to understand strategy and context, no matter what I've done. But from 20 years ago till now, the game's changed, and, and, and I look a lot at who I'm recruiting and what the business schools are providing to me today. Um, and Sessions and initiatives like this are critical to the future of the conversation we're having here. Um, I have two hats. I work in the innovative space of big data and advanced analytics and also work in the customer space. And the thing that we always have with our customers, and I've got quite a few universities as major customers, is that we design products and services without asking the customer. And so we think what the best next product is going to be. Mm. And, and in the connected world that we live in today, if we don't work together on a shared problem, uh, and that shared problem is work ready, because it's costing me a lot of money when students aren't work ready, or a, a, a very swift career change, um, I think we're going to have real challenges as, as an economy. 
Um, and I, I don't know how many of you are, most of you are reasonably young, but when the VCR came out and there was the whole fight about are you going to buy Betamax or are you going to buy VHS? You guys remember that? Um, <laughs> I still remember before that. VCRs <laughs> yeah. now? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the internet we need to talk about. Um, but something, something amazing happened um, because in our whole knowledge economy, there's always dad knows or you know, mom knows. And, you know, and I grew up in a farm. You know, your father always taught you what the land was like and how to drive a tractor and what to look for on the leaves. But when the VCR came out, something flipped. And dad dropped the box and all the cables. And he said, Kurt, you go figure out how that thing works. And that has not changed, the, the, the DVD and the internet and the computer. And, and even with you, like, can you work out my new phone? You know? um, and that phenom phenomenon that happened in the you know, early 80s is really accelerating today. And that's really challenging how we educate within our businesses. And I think it's really challenging the university structure and particularly business school structure about how we embrace you know, and adapt to actually allow some of this bottom-up knowledge to come. Because we used to be you know, the adult parent-child methodology, the ones that know. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that, reflecting on some of the items in the report here. Um, as business, we actually need niche education more than ever. But that means flexible education. Um, I have so many spaces where I'm willing to put corporate money and corporate time at getting some of my staff better. So there is a real need for business schools to offer flexible, short, quick solutions that are practical because the education space is really crowded at the moment. Um, I'm happy to pay for brands and I'm happy to pay for quality. And, and then probably the, the other real amazing opportunity I see is this uh, adaptive learning. Um, and I think Sarah will talk a little bit about it. But how can we get early selection of the students to be good? And a lot of the, the research that was done here and the co-op programs, I think, are amazing levels of success. But how do we take that to the next level where we influence individual students' learnings so that when we pick them up later, they are ready and job ready for the job that we have picked them for. Everyone's careers are getting shorter. Um, I don't know how many of you have watched Shift Happen. It's a YouTube video that's been updated many times. And, and that's happening right before us right now. It's something that's very real. Um, and, and I recognize, and we've had, a, a, Sharon and I had a good chat about this, is Deloitte recruits in the top 5%. So, you know, you educate 100% and, you know, more than half of that graduate. So, but also work with that other 50% and all the clients we've got. Um, um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we make that job ready work for every student? Because not everyone's always going to end up in the top 5%. Um, and you know, it's getting more and more challenging every year. We run grad recruitment and we recruit three times a year and I've got interviews Monday morning till end and I know what will happen. The students will walk in there and they all have a CV and the only differentiator in that CV is a mark. Yet the student experience that you offer them as a business school and the ability to network and build relationships is the thing that I'm really after. And I think you know, for business schools to start and help articulate that as a CV value, how good are you at networking, will really differentiate what's happening in the buying behavior of one of your major customers. And I think all businesses would look at that the same way. So the CV started talking about more than just marks and what I did in the various subjects, but also demonstrated the ability to be networked and be creative, I think that'll be really valuable. Um, I just want to flick over and say one of the things that we, we're seeing happening is I've actually reduced the number of graduates that I hire year on year, even though my business is growing. Um, and that's quite a scary phenomenon. Um, and, and that's happening because in, in most organizations, we have a, a triangle-based approach. So you have someone at the top, and there's someone about them, and then the management, and then all the way down to your graduates. So we just focus on the graduate level for a second. Um, our triangle has gone thinner, yet we do the same amount of work. And on the right hand side, I'm hiring from adjacent industries. I'm hiring a lot more engineers than I've ever hired before. Because mm. engineers are now offering critical problem solving skills that I don't find uh, available within the business thinking community. And the engineering industry has become a lot better at being able to connect to strategy. And so, um, so that business buyer shrunk. I'm hiring adjacent industries and adjacent experience. And on the left-hand side, I'm hiring overseas. So right now, I've got three projects that are running, and more than 50% of my team sits in, in what we call EDC, our Extended Delivery Center. It's a nice word that talks about um, 
n not just cheap labor, uh, labor that is twice as good as what I can buy here. So for a quarter of the cost, um, the comparable uh, consultant that I've got that in Australia would have one, two, three years of experience starts with a minimum of three to five years of experience. And the senior consultant here that has three to five years of experience, I'm buying in India's five to ten years of experience. So we're not no longer just having a cost play, we're having a significant capability play. And the skills that we are buying in that space are mind-blowing. So if we think about that space is shrinking, how do we get as many of the students into that pine? This same picture will repeat itself over every industry that you look at over time, um, whether it's outsourcing some capability, like finance or HR. I think it's quite important that as, as a business community and the education and business community we think about it. Um, so I, I just want to touch on a couple of things, and I'd rather leave some time for Q&A. Uh, creativity is a big one, and, and it's a hard thing to demonstrate, and I agree with you, not, not most businesses know what creativity is. I mean, there are your exceptions. Um, I think we do particularly well. I think there's a lot of others that do it. Um, one of the Australian success stories and creativity and innovation is a company called Atlassian. Um, the guy started the credit card at $10,000, and they're worth half a billion dollars each today. Um, maybe a bit more, and they have amazing innovation concepts where they've embraced this bottom-up thinking. So they ran this concept called the FedEx Day where they put all these smart engineers, young kids in a room and said, go do what we've not been able to let you do, and 24 hours you must deliver something, that's the only rule. And they've developed some of the most amazing products in those 24 sessions. I've copied that with my data team, and we ran this thing called Data Studio. It's a play on art of data, and we let them run for 24 hours. And every one of my senior leaders who's part of our senior team said to me, they won't do it. You know, why they want to, they already work 12, 15 hours a day, why they want to do 24 hours? I, I have 100% show up to these sessions, and I have 80% of the guys work through the night, because they enjoy it. And the next morning I get the leadership, and we show them more amazing work in 24 hours than we do in three months. Um, Atlassian has taken the concept further. They, they now run an international competition called Ship It, which is the same 24 hour challenge across all of their development. They've got a big development house in Vietnam, the US, Australia. So it's a really great case study to have a look at. And I think that if students now want to come in with that CV, it's how do you demonstrate your ability to be creative and in some more innovative because if I buy raw skills I get them in India or I get them in, in, in Manila I get them even in the US or the rest of, 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 um, of Europe at much lower rates and much higher degrees of experience and the, the barriers of entry to the education for business have always been you know lower than saying building a lab or building a chemistry lab or building an engineering space so I think that's that's one of the areas for us to look at the other one is this flexible and adaptive program um, how, how can we do the education in the niche space that I spoke about. Because we have a structure, we have a curriculum. But what about the non-curriculum stuff and how can we reorganize some of the components you offer? Um, I, I told the panel group here that I recently needed to update my stats because I was getting embarrassed in meetings with my young staff um, about getting statistical terms wrong. That was never a good look for a leader. So um, I tried to go back to university and I spoke to two business schools about it. And they all offered me programs or a sub part of, and I had to sign up for a unit or two units. But it was lengthy, I had to go at certain times, and even if I could do it online, it was watching a lecture, a talk. Um, and I was happy to spend real corporate money on it. Um, in the end, one night in frustration, I found the Khan Academy. It's quite a few years ago now. And I did my whole course in the Khan Academy uh, over a course of you know, six or seven weeks at my pace. It was so dynamically linked. It's written for children, so it's kind of easy for me to use. <laughs> um, but it was fully flexible. The assessments worked. When there was a mistake, in, in one of the lessons, I could look at all the other crowdsourced comments that said, this is wrong, it should have been that. The guy never updated the lesson because everyone just looks down and says, yeah, that's an error, it should have been one over two, and aren't you good that you found it? So, so that's a real challenge as, you know, as this niche education is getting more and more dispersed because I'm buying the exact bits that I need. Um, the other thing about the flexibility and adaptive program is uh, in the business space, the material is developing faster than business schools can now turn them out. Mm -hmm. So um, the product that, that I try and uh, recruit in the market, only two universities in Australia deliver right now in a formal program. Advanced Analytics is delivered officially by Deakin University as the first and they developed it with the IAPA Institute and the second one uh, is Monash. And both of those are post-doctoral, um, oh, sorry, post-graduate uh, uh, degrees and they are good but they haven't established critical mass. We still teach actuarial, 
with rule sets to those same smart skills. And you know, to give you a practical example, I used to hire quite a few actuarial students, but we find it's too hard to, to reinvent them to the new level of thinking. And so I think that's one of the challenges of the rising up of how do we actually find something that's adaptive where the content's changing as fast as we can actually create the curriculum. Um, I'll probably finish off and just answer your last question about um, the knowledge economy. Um, it's, it is a really good question for Australia, um, you know, when we're resources rich. And, and I think, and on a personal view, I probably agree with you. Um, and one of the places we quite often see it in, let's talk about Western Australia, which we are dominant in, um, the consulting business that I live in is predominantly the uh, a knowledge economy. That's what we sell. And uh, it's amazing how many of the uh, conversations we have about whether some work gets done or not is done on the rates alone. So if, there was, if the knowledge was valued, especially in some of the areas of, of real niche, then there would be a price arbitrage for it. So I think that's a really good indicator of how many of the conversations are based on price alone. Mm. Can I just comment on that? Uh, sorry, Sarah, because it's just relevant. I mean, a big contrast between Australia and the US is that the big companies, the big multinationals, you know, like Raytheon, IBM, North Korea, North Korea, a lot of them are actually pushing universities and saying, these are the skills we need. You have to get your curriculum sorted because this is what we need and we need it now. And there, that's what I mean about a sense of urgency. Yep. There's not even a national conversation going on here about the, you know, the coming decade and what we're going to need. Uh, and that's, what I, that's a concern. And as Kurt said, I mean, there is no global shortage of labor. Uh, you can get cheap labor and good quality labor. People are going to move to where the jobs are. The question is whether Australia will be left behind in that mix. I'd like to at least give you Kurt a, a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, and uh, the report was fantastic, uh, Sharon, and I think that that's really uh, opened up the debate around management education, given some real insights, I thought, into the relationship also between management education and business schools, and of course, Management education isn't always situated in business schools globally, um, but there's some, a bigger debate around that mm -hmm. as well. So I just wanted to touch on a few areas around, uh, around the, that kind of struck in my mind from the, from the report, and also try and link that back into the kind of the Murdoch context of it as well. So I wanted to kind of bring out the context. I think a lot of the things that you've said in the report were actually very relevant for all of education, and I think that there are some kind of really significant challenges and, I like to say, opportunities as well. Um, and I think one of them is around massification. The massification of, of education is a massive uh, challenge, and the rising costs of education as well. So these two factors have really started to put a lot of pressure on higher education as a whole. Um, and obviously with digitization and globalization coming in as well, we've got a lot of very uh, challenging uh, uh, environments and contexts to deal with now that we probably didn't have when you know, most of us were at university. And I think the other issue that we've touched on a little bit is, you know, uh, millennials that are in the, millennial students that are in the uh, universities now and the Generation Z who are about to come in this year and next year also uh, creating a big pressure around um, their extrinsic motivation and the, their modes of using technologies, and <coughs> technologies and so on. So that's another pressure I would say. Um, and then there is this pressure which also you've really raised quite well in the report, which is around the, the need, and, and Kurt's touched on it a little bit, around the need for real world experiences in education. And I think that shift, and it's, it's what I would call a pedagogic shift as well, is also a really big challenge for universities mm -hmm. because you know we are geared up for lectures, we are geared up for seminars. You know those modes of delivery don't necessarily always fit so well with uh, experiential and uh, real world learning. So I think that those that context is in itself very challenging for our sector. And I think obviously within that context, uh, management education sits there too. So what I thought were the kind of for me the key messages arising. Um, were really centred on this idea that you picked up on around innovation uh, and creativity, actually, in a way, as well. Uh, so how do we support 
uh, teaching skills about innovation and creativity when actually even like top theorists in the field probably actually would have problem um, kind of uh, giving, an, uh, giving a really good definition particularly for creativity. It's an area where I did a little bit of research in that area and then kind of gave up basically because <laughs> it was just like, oh no, it's just too difficult. Um, but I think innovation is really key and I think uh, it, it's actually quite difficult to teach innovation in a kind of direct way. It's something that um, in constructivist terms, you know, we kind of come to that through a process of our experiences. And for me, that's why uh, learning and teaching in the modern environment and in the modern university is really about the learning experience rather than the curriculum. And I think that that is quite a big shift. Um, and I think for the universities to have to respond to that is not so straightforward as it sounds. You know, it sounds quite easy. But no, it isn't because our infrastructure isn't really geared up for that. Um, so I think for me it's a journey that we're on now and we need to understand that journey and understand how we can actually work together across the different sectors to, to make that experience really rich. And I think in order to do that we need to actually walk hand in hand with, with the different sectors. Um, and, you know, we're holding hands like in the room. <laughs> but you know, really it kind of does sound a bit tweet, but we really have to work together and it's really quite challenging because there isn't a space at the moment that's really obvious where we can actually work together. And at the moment, you know, it is through kind of workshops, it is through different kinds of approaches, through research projects often, uh, you know, through individual contacts, relationships over time. And we really need to find better ways to formalise that relationship. And I think something I'd like to take away today is some ideas, also to open it up to the audience as well, to see you know, how can we, are there innovative ways, are there creative ways that we can start to provide that space within which industry and academia can actually work together to support change and, and development and innovation. And so I'd really like to see uh, that area really focused upon in terms of strategy. And maybe that's something that could come out of, of your report as well, Sharon. It's sort of some really kind of quite simple guidelines of how you know we can move towards that. Um, so I think that those I've covered that really, but really it's that idea around you know how do we also offer that experiential learning, work integrated learning, obviously being an important part of that. Internships, placements, uh, probably having uh, co-creation of content and co-creation of curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the kinds of ways that I think we'll work together. Um, I won't talk about it too much today, but I've written a paper on my previous lab, the Serious Games Institute, and we had a lot of different ways that we were working with industry, and I think it's a very good model that we would look at maybe in, in another context. And so for me, it's really about uh, stepping back a little bit as well and having a kind of more compelling vision for learning in the future. And for me, that learning or new learning, as I described it in, in my book, is really about social interactive learning, it's about immersion and engagement, it's about the adaptive curriculum as Kurt was talking about, and it's really about personalization. So really thinking about that learning journey as a learning journey of one rather than a learning journey of a mass. So that's really challenging technically, and I've been working with Kurt in the kind of data analytics area, that's an area where we can start to push forward in to help us to do that. And I think really, for me, um, some of the things that came out of that report as well are around, uh, and that support some of the work that I've been doing, are kind of really around challenge-based uh, pedagogy. Mm -hmm. So how can we actually start to look at particular challenges? And I really like the idea of industry kind of leading on that and saying, look, this is the problem, this is the key problem in our industry, you know, help us to, to solve this problem. And I think really the problems should come from industry, not really from, from academia, and we should then try and support to kind of move forward in those areas. And I think that kind of problem setting, challenge setting, is something that could actually be quite fun, quite engaging, and quite a good way to bring the sectors together as well. And you know, there's a lot of new tools out there that we can do this with. You know, we've got social software tools, we've got content indication, Khan Academy, open access resources, um, gamification, badging. You know, there's so many ways that we can actually borrow those tools in order to make learning more exciting and more relevant to, to everyone. So I, I kind of I don't know how much time I've got. I don't want to really go on and on. But here's just sort of touching on some of the sort of some of the kind of drivers that I think are really important. So the pedagogic content, student driven and global and international drivers as well. So what then would be our kind of next steps? Um, I see this as very much a conversation, a dialogue with between the two different sectors and, and beyond. Uh, I do think that the university can play a really massively important role in supporting this type of approach. 
And I think universities will continue to produce very high quality candidates. And I think, you know, we, we do have more, uh, more global competition, of course, but I think it's really up to us to make sure that students are better than the other students and that we really actually rise to that challenge of preparing students to be work ready and to have the right employability skills and to be able to be creative, to be innovative. We've got a lot of benefits, you know, we've got a lot of things to build on here. I don't think that we've lost this game. I think, you know, there is a positive message to come out of it, but we do have to lift our game. I think all of us probably have to lift our game of it. And I think really, I suppose, part of it is even at the school age, I think there has to be better interconnection between the school age, universities, and the sectors. I think we have to see it more as a kind of continuum of life. And that's why I think the journey to the learning experience, that's quite powerful in, in terms of how we can bring these things together. And I do think ultimately the challenge-based approaches and co-creation of IP and, and these kinds of approaches are really what's going to drive the economy through innovation, through IP, through um, an excitement of, of what we can do and how we can solve problems. And I think setting that global agenda is something that Generation Z students are going to love. I mean, this really fits well with them. So yeah, I, I do think there are a lot of challenges here, but I also see the opportunities and you know, I think there's a lot of uh, excitement ahead and you know, there will be difficulties and there will be problems. But ultimately, I think we're moving towards you know, a different world but a more global and more connected and more in industry friendly world, which I think will be a really good thing. Thank you. conversation about every 10 years we have a review of management education uh, going back to 83 I think it was and then 96 David Carpen from a colleague of mine mm -hmm. and uh, I tend to say pretty much the same thing for the better engagement I subscribe to a theory that's well supported in the management literature and that is the things that get rewarded get done and uh, I don't think that universities and I'm not just talking about Murdoch I've worked in five different continents uh, in teaching and research. And I don't think we reward the kind of behaviors that uh, do what you guys are saying needs to be done, which I agree with. And just a short example, I had a student, a PhD student, a few years back. He did a study on the reading habits of managers ranging across a range of organizations, industries, and array of uh, levels, from senior managers down to first-line managers. And the evidence was overwhelming that managers don't read the academic literature. Uh, they don't read A star and A journals. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm trying to get to read my papers. <laughs> and they, they may read the Harvard Business Review or the California Management Review that don't have numbers in them. <laughs> but, uh, now, if you take that down to the, the younger staff today, I'm, I've been in management education for 43 years, but if you take a younger person today, and they're reading the tea leaves, what am I going to get rewarded for? It's A star and A, a drums, and plus good level teaching, mm -hmm. and that's not rewarding the kind of, of uh, behavior that you guys want. Maybe we could have the answer to that too. Oh, that's very controversial. Thank you very much. Well, I'm retired. Right. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and if we answer that question, we might also be retired. <laughs> Thank you. But it, it, is, yes, it is true that every 10 years we have these reviews and um, not much happens. I guess I'm not. I'm a little more pessimistic because I think now in subsequent years the global changes will mean that we're not going to be in the same position as we have always been, relying on resources, relying on primary industries, relying on just being a you know, healthy Western culture, because everybody wants that now. So in a sense, we're going to fall behind. We're already starting to show that we're falling behind. And you know, the economists say that we will, or you know, the standard of living will also start to decline. So I think that it is imperative that we kind of change the way 
we react to these reviews because it does have an impact. And really, the first, um, the first uh, indication of change is starting to recognize that we really need to be aware of all the issues that uh, we've been talking about. And the concern is that I don't think we're quite there yet. I, I, I hear you um, on the what rewards gets done. That's absolutely true. Um, we often talk about we spend a lot of time creating values that sit on the wall, then we act differently. And there's a, a beautiful cultural presentation. If you search the Netflix um, internal cultural story line, it talks a lot about you can't have a value and then promote someone else if they execute values that have different values. There's two big disruptions to education that we see, and I, I would probably go one step further saying, I don't think that the, this, that the change that you're talking about will come from internal, will come from external. But the education space is at least thinking about it. But the first one was distance learning, mm -hmm. which fundamentally changed the way we thought about how you could learn and whether you had to be on campus. And the second one is the flipped classroom, which we're having this personalized learning experiences now that are amazing. I mean, my children don't have to go to school to learn to read. ABC Reading Eggs is doing better than any teacher I've ever seen. So that flip classroom concepts coming everywhere, and both those things are working really well for for their specific times to change the you know external to internal view. Um, if if we measure the customer satisfaction with the products that are delivered of every student all the way back down to the people that teach them, and there's quite a lot of resistance to that within universities to be measured and and, and um, checked out. But if that was happening in, in a you know NPS and Net Promoter Score or Customer Satisfaction Score. We definitely started rewarding um, those that produce the best products and output. And I think the US is particularly good at that, mm. at rewarding those teachers that produce the best products. And I think that goes beyond the banner name in which you operate and actually becomes a personal brand. But it's also got a value. I mean, in Scandinavia, they don't necessarily reward the products, but they value yes. the process and they value the outcome. So it is really about. Um, how you want, you know, where, where education and uh, sits in terms of priorities. And, you know, Sarah was saying that the rising cost of education mean that we need to make decisions. Well, other countries are also experiencing rising costs in education because it does cost more uh, through technology in some ways to teach uh, 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 these days. But they're investing. And that's another difference between, you know, Australia and other countries. I think, uh, yeah. sorry. sorry, I had just one at the, the back. Yep. Um, I'm Janice Dobby, I'm the Associate Dean Learning Teaching in the School of Management Governance, and I'm not a business educator, I'm a political scientist, <laughs> represents what the School of Management Governance is, because that's the former business school with politics and sustainability. The intention is to enrich the education both of students doing a business degree, but also students who do arts degrees in politics mm -hmm. and sustainability. So that's the sort of context. Now, Sharon, when you were talking, you said that um, <coughs> business wants what they already have. You also said that um, <coughs> innovation is the key to productivity growth. My understanding of uh, the management literature and the economic literature is that the, if Australia's competitiveness is declining, people talk about productivity in one of the greatest predictors productivity and competitiveness is the quality of management. And yet, if our competitiveness is declining, what's the focus of Australian industry? Cost cutting. Cut the wages. Complain about penalty rates. <laughs> That's all we're hearing at the moment. That's what the, the editorial and financial review was all about today. So we have this dilemma. You know, innovation, creativity, flexible learning, creating the innovative business graduate of the future and yet business want what they've already had, or they think they want that. So that puts the university in an ethical dilemma because we actually have, you know, we actually consider that part of what we do is to support students in making, in, in enabling them to get jobs. And industry, in a sense, doesn't want what we're producing. If we're producing innovative graduates, and industry says, oh, I don't want you thinking outside the square. And that's why often students come back from work, experiential learning workplace, work integrated learning, they come back with, we don't want your innovative ideas, we want you to do what you've, we've always done. We just have this real ethical dilemma, we've got this disjunct, and 
it, it, we can't say, well, we'll educate the students to what we think industry wants, what they really need, because we actually have a responsibility to our students. So that I'm just sort of putting it out there, interested comments, because mm -hmm. I think it does have a sort of ethical dimension to what we're talking about. Well, I guess the real responsibility that we have to students is to give them the best quality education. Absolutely. And if they have the best quality education, they'll get jobs. Very often in Australia, the best quality education is sometimes not part of that equation. And that's a problem. So that we have a vocational approach, even to university <coughs> education, which a lot of other countries don't have. And I think, to be quite honest, universities have to come back and be in the front line about their role and their leadership role. And they haven't been there in a long time. Uh, and, and that's a critical, I think that's critical, but I think the universities themselves in general and business schools in particular will need to take the initiative because no one else will. So even though we want business to be responsive and to be partners and to collaborate, universities will need to set the stage for that to happen. Because I don't think business is really ready to do that. I think they need to be guided. And that's what I meant when I said, I think business schools need to be equally responsive and instructive for business. Uh, and I think it's absolutely critical. Now, if you look at all of our major companies, um, multinationals and a few um, Australian uh, international companies as well, and look at the senior executives. The majority of them are educated elsewhere. It's a global labor market now, and the experiences of these people are different than the Australians in terms of their educational background and in terms of their knowledge base. Well, we need to be competitive at that level, and that's what our outlook needs to be rather than looking internally. Australians have um, a history of being able to look within their borders because we're the lucky country. And the borders are now no longer meaningful. And that message, I think, really needs to get through. I mean, uh, an industry like the mining industry, we were talking about this over lunch, is starting to recognize that. You know, uh, you know we have enough coal that could keep us uh, rich forever, but there are lots of complicating factors now in relation to coal, in relation to iron ore. And Brazil now is involved, and China. So the whole world is changing, and we need to be at the forefront of that. So I guess that what I'm saying to you is universities need to re-establish their prime position um, as contributors to innovation in this country. And that's a big chore, but it's absolutely essential. I think if, you know, I might just say it's something. I did a lot of work in innovation and I did the uh, reports and jealous of government innovation, so that was <laughs> quite a challenge in itself. But some of the things that came up, and I'm in the West Australia now, so I'm actually on the practice side of the business, is that whole issue about fear of failure. You know, now I'm putting an idea up and to have your peers, and often they're, you know, 50 plus, very sort of strong practice managers stand out from your, from your cohorts and actually sort of look at that. And uh, I think there's a real opportunity there in actual learning projects to actually take, uh, and particularly maybe not-for-profit, where you want young graduates to you know, cut their teeth, to look at some projects where you're actually manifesting some really good outcomes from the creativity, and you know, taking those forward, because graduates don't know what happens inside the organisation, and they can get a microcosm of that by partnering with business. So there, there may be some opportunities there to do those things, and also to look at that rotary opportunity where people go overseas, and then you know, they actually see some of those professors and managers working in action, and they get the aha. I think it's very hard for people to actually get the aha if they're actually immersed in that very pervasive environment about fear of failure and not, and not uh, rewarding risk-taking. That was the big things that came out in a lot of the work that you did mm. in that area. Fear of failure and taking risks mm. in that environment. Yeah. I think the other, for me, the other key issue, uh, something that I've noticed um, here, is that there isn't that kind of startup funding for entrepreneur, supporting entrepreneurialism generally. Mm. There doesn't seem to be that nurturing uh, in the UK, we've got a lot of funding, and we were talking actually uh, before about um, the Technology Strategy Board, uh, 
uh, and they have something like, I think it's something like five billion that they put into uh, industry-led projects uh, where actually the academics in a way are a little, a little bit of a sideline, uh, but it's really led by industry. Um, but it's a fantastic way of supporting new IP generation and entrepreneurialism. And I think that's something that I really think in WA, we've got a lot of talent here, but we don't have that kind of state backing or federal backing to support mm. that real innovation that I think and I know and believe is, is actually here. I mean, if you look at Moodle, for example, I mean, you know, I think it's a great example of somewhere where, you know, we've got, you know, a leading guy in the world who set up a, a learning management system, which is fantastic. It's open source. Most universities are using it. A lot of industry are using it. You know, we've got that kind of quality here. Um, but we're not necessarily supporting it that well. So I do think that there is a kind of argument around how do we campaign for more support to go into entrepreneurialism and supporting that throughout, and whether that plugs in through industry or through universities, you know, I, I, you know we don't mind, as long as it's kind of going in there, because you know, we do have a lot of talent there, but, and we're not really you know, utilising it. So I don't think that the future is so bad, I just think we need to have more space for that collaboration and more, more support entrepreneurialism generally. Yeah, I think I think the um, risk averse Australia is a problem uh, for innovation. Um, and in terms of support, I mean, the um, data that comes out of the success rate, for example, in ARC grants mm -hmm. is a good example because you know the money has been shrinking. And in Australia, if you're a senior professor and have had lots of grants before, you're much more likely to get a grant than if you're a junior professor uh, and haven't had a grant before. Well, to me, that's related to risk aversion, you know, um, where people who are doing a lot of the same thing are getting a piece of the pie that's a very small pie. Um, in contrast to the states where you talk to, you know, you hear uh, entrepreneurs in the states and they talk proudly about their failures <laughs> because they made it eventually because of their failures and we don't have that same culture. Certainly not talking about ARC, I mean, that's, a, that's a public policy decision. It's not simply a, a, a decision on the part of the people awarding it. It's a public policy decision to concentrate research in those two people who are mm. you know, deluded in the past. And a limited amount. Yeah, yeah. and there's a lot of search. Yeah. 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 So we have to have a wider context, we've got a public policy context. But we don't have, we, we, we haven't got any discussions really about quality, uh, value of research, contributions. Really, all of the discussions have been around deregulation and money. Another question from the front, yes. I wonder if this is like Gordian, not that. Universities are caught in between two, two kind of you know sort of different issues. From one hand, the government uh, policy is to have mass education increase, get as many students as possible, up to forty percent of the population. So we get all these masses, hordes of people coming through the social machine. And here, the industry looks for specific skills like innovation, creativity, adaptability, and job ready. And I keep on thinking, if we want innovation, creativity, adaptability, and job ready. Should we test and admit the students in the first place when they get into the business school? And if we do that, then we're going to have to reduce this massification that you know Sarah mentioned. And if we reduce massification, business schools are not going to be the cash cows. Universities are going to actually start cracking up. Lots of other faculties are going to keep on suffering. And I keep on thinking, would the industry step in to help? No, they don't. Masses of human resources people in London and here too, they don't recruit quality students, they recruit the badge of the university that coming out. If it comes from London, Oxbridge, and this other two, it's perfectly okay. If they came from an ex-polytechnic like Coventry University, for example, this other two, they will reject them at the selection you know, stage and they put them you know, into the trash bin. And I keep on wondering whether there's an industry around here talking about how universities should manage themselves and how they should get with uh, the industry you know, uh, collaborating. But the realities are totally the opposite. It's driven by government policy, which says masses through the social machine, and bingo, turn them in three years into innovators, adaptability, entrepreneurs, all these all these other good, good things. And I keep on thinking that you know, that's not quite the reality. There's something wrong here. 
I think we've got to take control as well. We can't just say, oh, it's up to somebody else to do it. I think there has to be a kind of responsibility on you know, the different sectors, industry, you know, universities, whatever, to create that space and to create that, that it's about resources. support. Mm. We don't have the resources. Universities don't have the resources. They cannot actually... Well, maybe we have them, but we're not you know, allocating them in that way. I don't know. But you know, I think ultimately, you know, we can't kind of sit back and say, well, it's up to somebody else to solve the problem. I think we do have to be a bit more proactive. And I think maybe we have been a little bit not proactive in terms of this, not, not, not just in Australia, I think internationally, perhaps maybe um, America's a bit different. But I think there is a bit of a kind of, oh, well, we've always done it like this approach and a kind of conservatism which has kind of made us sit back a little bit. I think if we can start to say, okay, well, this is something that we really want to do, we really want to create that space for entrepreneurialism and creativity and innovation, well, then we have to actually start to, to looking to see how we do that. And that's a, that's a conversation and, and a d debate and discussion, I think, that, that needs to take place. Let me pre present an alternative view, because I don't think universities have a strong voice in this country, and I don't think they're listened to. And I think if we want any change uh, yeah, within universities, business needs to take up the voice yeah. for universities. And the business and industry. Forget politicians. Politicians will listen to business and industry, but they're not interested. That's why I think it's business and industry, which is the major stakeholder of you know, our graduates who should be actually saying we need to be investing. Um, and I say that only because we have had two decades of cutbacks. I mean, with one exception, a brief window uh, during the Red Gillard governments where there was some injection of funding. Throughout the whole entire Howard period, there were cutbacks to universities and we heard nothing. Uh, there are cutbacks now, there isn't an industry voice saying, invest in universities. Mm -hmm. um, but if business and industry were to talk about the importance of our smart economy and the need for us to move into the 21st century, there might be more hope for universities to have a voice. Um, it's the universities are complicated societies. People don't understand how you work, how you operate. <laughs> you don't even understand how you work and operate. <laughs> but you know, we do probably the most important function uh, you know, that uh, is uh, setting up the platform for the future. And it's unrecognized. So it is business and industry. Uh, you know, as I was trying to develop rapport with the audience, now I'm going to uh, lose that rapport because I've only got two more questions. I've got one question here and one question there. And then I'm sure that the panel will be delighted to hear about any other issues that you'd like to discuss with them. So good to have your question, please. Yeah, I'm Sue Ellen Chapsel. I work with the University of Western Australia and the AIM. Um, I'm going to ask a really, what will sound like a stupid question, because I'm going to ask you for a short comment on a, a topic that we could spend the rest of the day or weeks talking about. It follows on from the previous questions, and I'm particularly interested, Sharon and Kurt and Sarah, given your experience, you might also might want to comment. We've acknowledged the implicit tension and explicit tension between universities and business. Sharon, you've very succinctly captured the fact that business isn't really um, listening to universities or looking to universities or promoting them. What then's the role for, or the magic recipe for universities to work with business in the not for degree space, in the earn a learner space, in the, in the supporting the workforce in its position and that executive training and development space? Well, from my point of view, you need to show what you can offer business. You need to show that um, if business doesn't take up this opportunity, this is what this is what A will lead to, and this is what's happening amongst your competitors. So it needs to be translated in terms of their own needs. They need to understand how it can be applied effectively within a business context. Uh, and I don't think that case has been made. I mean, I was. Um, working with one university, looking at their engagement policy, and it was terrific. All the things that they can do for students, all the things that they can do through research, all the things that they can do through connections. But from a business perspective, what does it mean for me? What am I going to get out of it? And that's, I think, the message you need to be able to translate what it is you're offering. And the fact that it's happening in the space elsewhere. So that's what I think would probably have meaning for business. I, I don't know if there are business people here who might want to comment on that, but to me, that's what I think really needs to happen. And I don't think that message has really 
been clearly, um, clearly uh, conveyed. Okay, we've got one last question. Thank you. Hello, um, David Stroud. Um, I was uh, I've been to university. I've been in the Commonwealth government. And now I'm in the commercial sector. So I'm still. I just turned forty, so I'm sort of not quite as young as I used to be. But, um, <laughs> still a pup. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, I guess um, probably an observation that if universities aren't in the front shaping, so shaping the strategy then they're hedging against macroeconomic trends that are against them. So your curriculum and your infrastructure is too slow, and you'll simply be behind. And so the students that you're providing will always be behind, because the, the trends move so fast. So that's probably an observation. And I think we'll look at the last five years and think we've never had it as good. Yep. Because those times, are, in my opinion, are over. So that's a, so that's my sort of business perspective, and I'm a, um, I guess a, an economist by by background and leaning. Um, the second thing, the question, the question is, um, so I think the best I came to, uh, I guess business models and innovation quite late in life, but um, things that you come late in life, you're very passionate for. So for the students that you see coming through. And I guess observations from business, um, the lean startup movement, yep. and how it defines a business, um, I think are some of the best tools for students because then they can define whether they are how they're contributing to the latest business model, how they might find something for themselves, um, and, and I guess so. I'm interested in what you've seen in your observations with businesses and your studies um, around this sense of, because we're all trying to find meaning, students can find meaning in understanding business models. I guess that's the, so that, that's my sort of general you know, question. Would you like to uh, I, I, And if I may, I just want to answer that previous question because I thought it was a really good one. And just to think, it's hard to give you a short answer, but. Um, I hear the word they a lot, they must, business must, and universities must, and it, it should really be we, because mm -hmm. I, I start off saying this is a shared challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this whole Mars and Venus stuff, you know. Yes, I don't read the papers because they're too long, and if they're relevant to me, I will. The reason I read the Harvard ones because they're really interested, and then if they're interesting, I'll read all the detail too. So if it makes it relevant, then it's a really simple buy and sell transaction. And just to give you the, the, this question, what's the value proposition of university? Because by brand, you attract different raw material. But who takes the raw material and makes them the best? Because <laughs> that's, that's what your value proposition is. Mm -hmm. It's not about, you know, it's not just about what the final product looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just two stats for you that, that are, are from the education sector. In New South Wales, in a university which will remain nameless, four of the t top ten commerce students never set foot in class. But it all looks another piece of learning. So what's the value proposition for that university? And the second one, or for, for those students where they came, it was the student experience. And the second one is, right now, the stats still need some work. 25% of graduates from last year are un- or underemployed. So again, I challenge, what's the value proposition that the machinery, that this machine, the sausage machine you referred to, is producing? It's not an incremental fix, it's radical redesign. And like I said earlier, the market forces at play will change that, whether it's the Khan Academy or other things where the cost structures have been significantly lower because the cost just can't keep changing like it is. Again, it is a shared model and I think we need to work at it together and we need to try lots of experiments where we fail at mm. and maybe that's one of the ways we go.